You're listening to The Peach Pit. I'm here with Vito De Francesco from the band Pyramid Theorem. Vito, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me and welcome to The Pit. Derek, no problem, man. Much appreciated. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Fantastic. Uh, it's a nice day here in Penticton, so I can't complain. Uh, how's everything? You're in Montreal or Toronto? Uh, just north of Toronto. It's 18 degrees and sunny. It's fantastic. I might go play baseball later. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So uh, you were recently in the Shredders of Metal drum off on Banger TV. That's correct. I was. Yeah, we filmed that back in February of this year. I was just talking to Josh Hamp from Earth's Yellow Sun last week, and he said, you should have won. You for sure should have won. <laughs> uh, well, well, I mean, thanks on that, Josh. And, we, and we're actually friends. We've toured with Earth's Yellow Sun, so <laughs> it's good that Josh is saying that. But you know what, man? It was, uh, it was just mainly for exposure, I got to say. Like, when I got the, the thumbs up saying that I had been selected to be a contestant, I was just like, first and foremost, I was over the moon because I knew Banger Films from – you know, way back from the Iron Maiden documentary. And then I, I knew that they, they had done the shredders of metal thing. So when I saw that it was a drum competition, I'm like, you know what, let me, let me try and see if, uh, if I could actually get through. And I submitted the video, like I think three minutes to go the actual deadline day. And like three or four days later, they had mentioned, yeah, you know, you're, you're uh, going to be a contestant. And if you'd like to come down, we're going to be doing two days of filming. So they were all fantastic drummers, so it's fun to 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 look back at that and uh, and yeah, the the final was really really cool. Unfortunately, it didn't come out on top, but Derek from um, what's the band there, Centuries of Decay, he's a he's a great drummer, so no shame in losing to that guy. And the whole thing is really just a, a feel good kind of promotional thing. I think at the end of the day, all of us can agree that music isn't the Olympics. It's about, you know, subjective, just your own personal taste and everything like that. So exactly. it's not really a winning or a losing thing. It's just kind of like showcasing all the different talent that we have in this great country and this awesome genre. Absolutely. Absolutely. And even looking back at the guitar one that they've done in the past, a, a whole bunch of people in the comments are just like, wow, this drumming one is like, leaps and bounds better you got to keep doing the drum one so let's see where they go with the next season but yeah it was definitely a, a great experience from top to bottom that might also be because watching a drummer is a lot more exciting than watching a guitar player even though the guitar player can do all these different fancy faces and like flinging his guitar around and ingy mom scene and stuff when you see a drummer really ripping on a drum set, nothing will get your adrenaline going more than that. Absolutely. And that's, <laughs> and that's the funny thing too, talking with a whole bunch of people, like <laughs> when they're at live shows, they normally look at the drummer. Cause if you're, you know, even if you're 15 feet away from a guitar player, it's kind of hard to see what's going on. But when you see that drummer moving all of his limbs and like you actually see the kit responding to what he's doing, definitely a, a fun thing to watch live for sure. So I need to know your uh, superhero origin story. How do you remember uh, falling in love with music? Oh, I was much too young to actually remember that, I guess, that moment. But I guess it all, I'm going to have to blame my father on that when he was a drummer uh, growing up. And before I could even walk, he was putting me on his knee behind the drum kit with a couple of sticks and I was just making noise. And I, I would say that that started, yeah, it was probably like a year or two when that uh, whole thing was going down. And by the time I was able to walk and reach the the kick pedals by myself, I was down there without even being told. Like, you know, some, some people, <clears throat> their upbringing with music, it's like, you know, you get the people who, oh, I, I was forced to play piano and do piano lessons when I really didn't want to. For me, it was like I, I had to be told to come upstairs because I was drumming too long. <laughs> which kind of sucks for my parents because uh you know three four hours a day of drumming is kind of a nuisance without a, especially without a um, soundproof room but yeah there, it, it really did just start when I was way too young to even remember but I, I do know that it was definitely Rush and uh, Neil Peart may he rest in peace he was the, the person that just kept my passion going because I've been a Rush fan for my entire life. I could say that for sure without hesitation that without those, those three guys, I wouldn't be here talking to you. And, uh, that's when you met Stefan, uh, Stefan. Yep. 
Yeah, uh, and you ran into him and you both bonded over Rush. Yeah, that's actually how we met. A mutual friend of ours um, had a cottage weekend when we were just, we actually were still in high school. And um, I remember being outside. It's actually really vivid. The, the mutual friend of ours, he had a cousin there as well who was Stefan's friend. And I was really good friends with Stefan's friend's cousin. And we were kind of two groups, two separate circle of friend groups that were there that weekend. So we were in the backyard, a pretty big backyard. And my group of friends is in one area. His group of friends is in the other. We're kind of like intermingling. But I remember like we were just, you know, shooting the breeze, smoking, drinking. And I, and I heard closer to the heart being played on an acoustic guitar like at the very very back of the backyard and i'm like i pretty much left the conversation i was in to go and follow that music i'm like what is that and i remember he was sitting in the middle of like a chicken coop with a cigarette just playing this song and i'm like oh man that's that's closer to the heart like i love rush and we just started chatting for at least like 10 15 minutes and he was showing me all the songs that he knew from rush on the on his guitar and like i think a couple of weeks later our mutual friend said, Hey man, you want your phone number? Let's, let's kind of get together for a jam. And yeah, that was in 2006. So 14 years later, we're still kicking. And you can still hear the influence of Rush. I mean, right from your guys' opening track on the new album, I was immediately just like, wow, that's a Alex Lifeson chord right there. That's a Jetty Lee bass line right there. That's totally the kind of Tom Phil that Neil would do. <laughs> like yeah, Everything awesome. just felt that way. Not that you guys are trying to like rip them off or anything like that. I Because I feel I, I, we want to get into the new album. When we talk about Element of Surprise, it was like every song was kind of its own exploration for you guys. Yeah. Whereas with Beyond the Exophere, it's like you guys have put all these elements together and found a sound. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we had... Uh... And, and we're not one to shy away from our influences. Like, you know, we're huge Rush fans. We're huge Dream Theater fans. We like all sorts of the classic rock, the Van Halen, and also may, may he rest in peace. That was a shock as well. Yeah. But we've always been ones to, you know, not shy away from who we're influenced by. And and some people even say like, oh, doesn't it bother you to, to be compared to them? And I always have to think to myself, like, how can I be mad when someone says, oh, you guys sound like Rush? But thank you. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to say, oh, that sucks. And and again, like we, we always try to to pay homage to to our influences. And, and at the same time, you know, we try to like bring our own flavor to the mix. And I think once you bring, you know, all your influences to the forefront and try and tweak little things here and there, that's how you develop your own sound. So that's pretty much what happened there. And yeah, and you had mentioned Element of Surprise. And that one there was a... A, like a constant effort on all of our plate pages to say, you know what, we want each song on this record to have its own different vibe, just to show that, you know, we could do the classic rock thing. We could do the prog metal thing. We could do the poppy thing, dare I say. But with this one here, yeah, once we uh, connected with the producer of Beyond the Exosphere, Rich Chicky, that was one of his main points. He's like, yeah, you guys got to find that one thing that makes you you and just roll with it instead of trying to you know, be like a, a minestrone and just a whole bunch of different sounds in one. Pick one and go for it. And I imagine when you guys started writing material for this album, you probably didn't imagine this album being released with the world in the state that it's in right now. Yeah, that was um, that was definitely a shock because it, it's funny. We released it in August of this year, but we had recorded it back in March of last year. And we wrote it starting essentially... The first track that we wrote for that, Sam would have, uh, Sam usually writes, I would say like 70 to 80% of the material. He's got all the ideas and the riffs. And then when we get together as a band, that's when we kind of, you know, add our own little bits into the mix. But I would say Sam usually comes to the, to the plate with a majority of the riffs that we're going to have there. And I think he wrote the first song on Beyond the Exosphere, like at the end of 2017. So when uh, when all this stuff started happening in March of this year, we were kind of we, we were still sitting on the record because it, it kind of screwed up our plans as to what we were going to do with the release. And it was so relevant, like we're looking at the lyrics that we had written and recorded, you know, almost a year ago at that moment. And we're like, holy cow, like everything we're talking about here is kind of it's kind of happening in a scary sense. So wasn't our intention. It was just kind of where we thought the world was headed 
for lack of a better term. And here we are kind of living in these desperate times, you know? It's it's sort of like, uh, I mean, not to compare you guys to another band again, but I mean, it's like how Haken re- released their album called Virus, yeah. and it has absolutely nothing to do. It's it's just a continuation of their last album, right? And they're yeah. just trying to stay true to their artistic, uh, whatever they want to do. So with you guys, I kind of sort of happened again, right? It's like you wrote lyrics. I, w- I want to talk more specifically about, uh, uh, shoot, I forget the name of the song. Uh, you made a music video with garrett henry as you've done a lot with him uh the song under control yes yeah the music video for that you really kind of touch on what's going on right now and the feeling would you like to kind of get into just like what what is it you guys are trying to present with that song or that video yeah so that that video itself um that came about actually through garrett the director and, and like you'd mentioned he's done all of our music videos so far up to date and that's how many are we at with him now? I think six or seven. So, you know, we had a couple of preliminary meetings once the record was finished. And we're like, all right, what are what's going to be the quote unquote single that we're going to try and push and make a video for and and all that stuff. And and he had mentioned like, yeah, the the under control song to him. He saw like you know it's like fake news, the media and and all that stuff. And that's essentially without being too direct that's kind of what the song was written about like even the the title itself is a double entendre under control you can look at it as oh you know we've got things under control we're fine or the other way it's like you're under control like you have no say whatsoever so he thought it'd be a really cool idea to implement all the media and stuff and again you have to understand this was also supposed to be filmed before everything kind of went to shit and went on lockdown because we were supposed to film all of our content for this record, including that music video, the first week of March. And we had had these meetings about the music video back in January. So we already had these ideas of what the video was supposed to be before it actually happened. And then we kind of had to rearrange our plan because of the lockdown. So we couldn't even film the videos that we had planned to film in March. We had to wait four months and film them in July. So it's just funny how, you know, having these meetings and, oh yeah, we're all on the same page. This is cool. I like your interpretation of this video. And then everything kind of shut down and it almost made us want to do it even more, you know, to kind of say, you know, guys, like kind of maybe take a step back from what the media is telling you and have your own opinion instead of just taking everything they're saying literally and, and, and not having your own thought process. I really connect really strongly with that. And I, I, I don't, I don't have the words. I don't, I'm not a news source. I don't know what to tell people. I don't want to tell people what to think. So my only solution to that lately has just been playing a lot of rage against the machine really loud in my car. <laughs> and that works for me. <laughs> I was into the radio yesterday and, and, and that, uh, what's the song? Um, Lights out. Why don't you do what they told you? What song is that called? I'm t- 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 oh, uh, Killing in the Name of. Killing in the Name of. That's it. Yeah. So, and that, that came on yesterday. And, and it's funny. I was listening to the lyrics on that. And then they also say you're under control in that whole chorus. And I never heard that before. And I'm listening to it at a, at a stoplight and I'm hearing that. I'm like, man, that sounds like our record. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or, or just our record sound like that one. So, yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. Well, I imagine when you guys were writing it, like you said, like this is all long before pandemic and everything like that, but it was already something you must have seen on the horizon, just the way social media, fake news, all this stuff is just dividing us. Oh, and like, I don't know, maybe this is the one of the cures that we need is music like this to kind of make us all like realize how sheepish we're being. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's it's coming to a point where, and, and now you can't even have like, I'm finding that, you know, there's both good things and bad things coming of what we're dealing with right now. But I feel like even having a simple conversation now with people who don't view the same things that you view, they, everyone just gets really defensive and, and standoffish at points when you're just trying to have a conversation. But that, you know, going back to the whole thing, music is, is probably the thing that's suffering the most. I mean, we were the the first in we this industry's been suffering for you know the last twenty to thirty years with all technology and, and 
and especially now that, you know, the industry was the first one to kind of get the boot and say, oh, you can't work, you can't go and play live, and we're going to be the last ones to be doing what we need to do. So, you know, the music that's going to be coming out in the next year or so that all these bands have had to postpone tours and appearances and stuff, I think it's going to just speak volumes to to what we need to do as a society to kind of get back on track. Especially when at a time like this, I think we need art and artists more than ever to keep us all, you know, just on the right path. (laughs) Absolutely. I could agree with that for sure. Uh, Going back to the album, working with Richard Chickie, what what was that like? That was an incredible experience. I I constantly had to keep pinching myself during rehearsals saying, we're actually working with the guy who told Neil Peart and Getty Lee, like, hey, try that again. (laughs) <laughs> yeah that was that was really cool and and he i could honestly say that without his input and and work ethic this record would not even have nearly sounded as awesome as it does because he he pushed us so much we had a few days of pre-production with him uh just us four and him inside of a room working on all the songs before we recorded them and he was pushing us to be proggy like we had some just as an example like we had some songs that were in standard four and he's like, all right, now you guys got to tweak this out. So even under control, like the, the chorus section for that was just standard for like regular, you know, just you could bob your head to it. No problem, whatever genre you're into. And he's like, no, nah, that's got to be a little different. And then it it ended up being this really weird chorus that I had to throw in some funky drumming to. And that was done like, you know, a couple of days before recording it. So. I can definitely say that yes, and and not to mention the the songwriting that he helped with, but sonically putting his stamp of expertise on it with the you know the recording of it, engineering. He mixed the record, he mastered it. It just sounds, you know, you could put on any Rush or Dream Theater or any sort of record that you can think in this genre, and pound for pound, I think it sounds just as good as, if not better, than than some of those other bands' music. And also with this uh, album, uh, since uh, the first album you guys did, you had a 12-minute song, and The Dream was a half hour long almost. Yeah. Uh, and But with uh, Element of Surprise, you kind of went back to kind of shorter, well, I mean, shorter in terms of prog songs. Yeah. Uh, beyond the Exophere, you just, right out of the gates, opening track, almost 18 minutes long. Was that a deliberate decision, or is it one of those things that when you just start writing music, you just see where it goes? Um, the, the long track that the title track that beyond the exosphere there was essentially always going to be track one. Um, but, but even that song, before we went into pre-production with Rich, before we recorded, there was actually a section in that song, like a three minute bit that we had actually removed. And when we came to rehearsals or sorry, you know, I guess pre-production rehearsals, let's call it we didn't show rich that three minute section that we had taken out. And it's funny because you know, that, that long song was at that point, like 13 minutes, let's say. And and rich came to us. He's like, you know, there's something missing with that song. Like, is there a way (laughs) you could write another piece between the two? And we're like, well, funny enough, we have something that we're not super happy with. We couldn't really fit a vocal in there. That was the issue there. And then, you know, we showed him the music for that. And he's like, Oh, guys, what are you thinking? Throw that in. Like, for sure. We just have to get that good vocal line and, and it'll fit perfectly. So wow. that, that song is an extra four minutes long because of Rich. <laughs> but yeah, when we, when we finished everything, we were, um, we were recording a whole bunch of stuff in the studio and we were kind of 90% leaning towards having that be the first track. And it, and it just makes sense. Like, you know, a prog band, if, if we're trying to quote unquote, sell ourselves as a prog band, then let's not shy away from the fact that we have an 18 minute song and, and hide it in the middle or throw it at the end. Let's, you know, let's put it at the very beginning so that the first thing people hear is going to kind of blow them away or so we hope. Right. I mean, that was the, the thought process. And now looking at the whole track listing, I'm super excited and, and happy that we decided to keep it there. Cause I don't think it would have flowed properly if we would have put it at the end. I agree. And a uh, flow is something that I kept uh, being uh, taken back to when I listened to the album. You guys have a really strong sense of musical flow. As I was listening to this eight, 18 minute long song, 
at no point in it did I feel like it just kind of got wanky, like, you know, wankery, just a bunch of riffs just put together. Mm -hmm. It always had like a, I don't know what the word is, but how do you guys know when you're doing too much? Um, well, we're a prog band, so we always do too much. <laughs> but but I, as a prog fan, like I'm digging it in, but I know when bands go too far. Do you know what I mean? It's like sometimes you're listening to a song and you're just like, that didn't need to be there. That was just them playing notes for the sake of playing notes. Yeah, And I, I don't get that feeling from you guys. Thank you. Yeah, we try to avoid, I mean, you know, certain songs. We We always tend to write for the song. We never... We never really get together when we're writing and say, all right, this song's got to be four minutes long. It needs a chorus, a bridge, a verse, and, you know, cookie cutter. We, we never really do that. We always sit there and say, all right, how many riffs do we have? Does this work with that one? No, that doesn't work. All right, that could be its own thing. All right, now we need an intro. And by the time we're, like, finished writing a song, we don't even time it. We're just like, you know, what, what does this song need with – that longer track, it was a sense before we had written it that we wanted something long, but we didn't have a time frame set. We didn't say it's got to be 18, it's got to be 23, it's got to be 11. We just had all this music that we kind of put together and realized, all right, we got an epic on our hands here, guys. So we really do try not to repeat ourselves musically. I mean, some sometimes you have to go back and and revisit a riff here and there, but we're always trying to keep things interesting for the artist. And if, quite frankly, if an 18 minute song repeated a, the same riff 10 times, I myself would want to change it. So, you know, when we were writing that, it was, it's more looked at like it's three or four songs put into one as, as opposed to one 18 minute song that's revisiting the same riffs over and over. That's, that's a, I think a smart way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go back to the music videos and just how did you guys develop this relationship with Garrett Henry? So we've known Garrett for, geez, I'm going to have to say at least nine years now, nine or 10 years, uh, a mutual friend of ours um, had actually mentioned like, Oh, you know, you got to come see this band live. They're really good. We played a couple of shows with this guy and, and his friend Garrett's like, all right, I'm going to come and see what the hubbub is. And, and he had saw us, perform i think it would have been probably sometime in 2009 2010 and he liked the show we ended up connecting with him and he's like yeah you know guys i do some music videos i'd love to to get involved with you guys and he showed us some of his work and we're like absolutely man you got you got that vision and and since then he's worked on he worked on every single professional video that we've done since then and i think that's you know we're up to six music videos now three live videos and everything that you know we've we've needed to do with a video aspect of it we've always called him without hesitation uh but it seems like like i was talking to you before you're into photography and video yourself do you do you, do you see yourself ever dabbling into the more directing of the videos or more of the photography behind it or something like that um, yeah i mean we always all four of us in the band kind of you know, we, we view ourselves as artistic, so we always had little input. And, and the first few videos that we we did, I actually directed them along with Garrett. Okay. Just because, again, I have that sense of, you know, I, I know. And, and also, I edited the first couple of music videos. Uh, the, the last two that we did with him, it was completely in Garrett's hands. But the first couple is he was filming them. He and I would direct them, and I would sit there and edit them all. So I, I kind of know what I'm going for when I'm looking at the footage and trying to compile all of the, uh, the shots together. So that, that's why he and I directed the, the early few, just cause I'm like, Oh, if I'm editing it, I want a shot that looks like this so that I can put in a shot after looks like this, you know, <clears throat> excuse me. And, and same thing with the photography. I mean, just recently we had, we had done a really cool photo shoot with um, a Toronto guy called Dustin Rabin, who's worked with, the Foo Fighters, Metallica, the, his list goes on and on as well. But same thing before we we um, we did all of our photo shoots on our own end. It was the same thing. Like I, I just feel like, you know, I've been in the industry on my own at least twelve years now, eleven years. So I, I, I feel like I've got a good handle on what we're we're trying to look for when it comes to getting all that media together to uh, to show everybody. 
And you guys obviously know as well what kind of visual you want to go with your music because you've you've matched it. I, I have to say your artwork, it just it fits. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, that was uh, that was also done by a friend of ours. And it's all it's funny how that we actually had another artist working on a uh, a piece for the album, the album cover. And we had gotten like three or four samples back and we're just like, man, we're not <laughs> we're not feeling this. We're not on the same page. So we were kind of last minute scrambling uh, to find another artist and, and one of our mutual friends as well. One of actually, I should say it's one of Sam's buddies, um, but we got to to know him over the course of him finishing the artwork. And, and he stepped up to the plate with like two weeks to go before the deadline. And he handed us that and we're like, man, that now that's someone who gets what we're going for. <laughs> Oh, well, I'm glad that it happened because it it is great, great artwork. Uh, yeah. For what do you guys, or what do you yourself see on the horizon for yourself and the band? Um, I mean, as of right now, we're we're like every other artist on the planet right now. We're kind of in limbo uh, on the live music aspect of things. I mean, uh, uh, we were again this this year has been such a kick in the pants to so many artists and, and ourselves included we were actually looking at booking a north american tour for september and october of this year so technically we should be on the road right now but we had to halt our plans back in march um just because again everything's shut down and we're not allowed to play so until until we get the thumbs up that we can play live right now we're just sticking to our release plan getting out all of this content that we filmed and you know if it goes another couple of months once our content plan is over with all of the the material that we've got to release we're going to try and get back on the road as soon as possible but if that's not going to happen then we've got to hunker down and write some more music to release for everybody or else you know in this day and age if you're out of the limelight for more than 10 seconds you get forgotten about so we definitely got to get some new material going we're actually in, in the middle of trying to film um a live release as well not necessarily to an audience um we're, we're trying to get something really cool um with the city of toronto i can't really say too much just in case it doesn't happen but if it does happen it's going to be something really really cool and really really special so not going to be like all those other bands that are releasing it on a stage with nobody there it's going to be a little different so pay attention, everyone. You never know what might happen in the pyramid theorem universe. <laughs> exactly. We should know, I would say, within a couple of weeks if, if our plan can come into fruition. But yeah, it's going to be a, a really cool little, little live experience. What advice would you give to anyone who's just trying to pursue their dreams? Uh, it, you know what? It, it's, it sounds cliche, but it is the damn truth just never give up because at some point if someone's living their dream it was a dream to them at some point and if they would have given up then they wouldn't be living their dream and and we're still chasing i mean you know we're 14 years into this as as a band the same four guys we've had zero lineup changes we're all on the same page musically we all have that same vision of what we want to be doing and and you know i, I maybe a little biased but I, I don't know of any any artist or any relationship for that matter that's had no you know 14 years of minor success and still plugging away to to keep it going and, and musically speaking you know bands go through lineup changes like more than i change my underwear and we've, <laughs> and we've had the same four goofballs for 14 years three records deep still trying to attain that goal. And I, I can honestly say that, you know, I don't think we're going to stop until, until we can show the world what we, what we're capable of doing. We want to play live all over the world to whoever, wherever they'll have us. So until that, that happens, I'm not going to drop a drumstick. <laughs> Strong words from somebody who knows how to put them. Everybody, this is Vito De Francesco from the band Pyramid Theorem. Thank you so much for taking time to talk to me. Oh, Derek, man. Thank you, man. This was a great experience and I'm really glad we can make this happen. Me too, man. Me too. Is there anything else that you'd like to say to our listeners? Uh, 
yeah, guys, you know, check out check out the uh, the band Pyramid Theorem. We've got all of our uh, socials, the the fun stuff, the Instagrams, the Facebooks, where we connect with each and every one on a daily basis. And we hope you like the record. That's you know, we put a lot of work into it, so we're very confident that if you do get a chance to check it out, you will not be disappointed. Everybody, Vito De Francesco from the band Pyramid Theorem. Thank you for taking time to talk to me. Beyond the Exosphere has been out since August. So if you haven't listened to it yet, then you're really letting yourself down because it's an awesome album. <laughs> so go get it. Go listen to it. 17 minutes right off the bat from the opening track. If you're into prog metal, this is where it's at. So make sure you check it out. And Vito, take care of yourself and uh, have a good rest of your day. Likewise, Derek. Thanks again, buddy. We'll chat soon.